Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland Evo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 9 a.m. We also meet here at the church and gather together as a body of Christ, and we pray for one another. And also for you, if you would like some prayer, you can post something there, and we will pray for you, or private message me, and we will make sure that we pray. Good morning, Patty. Good morning, Nelson. I'm glad you guys have joined us today. If you are in the neighborhood and you'd like to join us here, we're at 5383 Martin Street in Harupa Valley, California. And today we are in the book of Colossians. And we'll be looking at chapter 2. Let's go ahead and pray. Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for another beautiful day. And as we begin the week, Lord, we pray that we begin it with you, Father. Lord, that we would sit at your feet, as Mary did, and we would hear from your word, Lord. Your commandments, your instructions, Father. Your encouragement, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us, Lord God, to fulfill uh, your word and what it says, Lord. That it would be applied to our lives, that it would glorify you in every way, Lord. And this is our challenge and our struggle in life, Father, is to be children that obey their their Father in heaven. Father, bless us today. Lead us and guide us, Father. We need you, Lord, in our lives, and we need you to help us through the struggles uh, that we all are going through at this moment, whether it's pain, whether it's uh, financial difficulty, whether it's relationships, Lord. You work out those things, Father, for your glory. And you also work in our character, Father, that we would be shaped and fashioned after your Son, Jesus Christ, Lord. And we would truly understand what you're doing in our lives and how you're changing us and making us better uh, to glorify you, Father, in everything, Lord God, that we would point to you, Father, in every way of the word, Lord. So now minister to us through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Good morning. Thank you again for joining us, Dina. Glad you're joining us here. We're in Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Um, last week we looked at chapter 1 and we saw that Christ was to take the preeminence. In other words, he is supposed to be first in our life above anything else. And now Paul gives us some instructions. And by the way, all of the epistles um, that Paul had written are written to churches or to persons like Timothy or Titus, but they're all instructional. We consider them instructional letters to the churches. So when you're reading the epistles, which is uh, like Romans and Corinthians, and then uh, uh, what comes after that? Romans, Corinthians, uh, Second Corinthians, right? <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, Second Corinthians, and then Ephesians, Colossians. You know, all of these epistles, Titus, Timothy, Jude, they're all instructional. So you view them as instructional books and that God is going to instruct you instruct you on life situations. And so in verse uh, 2 here, he pretty much gives the goal for the whole church there. And I just want to read out of context for one second. Because Paul says that your hearts may be encouraged, be knitted together in love, and attaining to all the riches of the fullness assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ. So... The goal of the church is to be in unity, to be in love, to be knitted together according to the scriptures. So Paul starts off in verse 1, For I want you to know what a great conflict, conflict or a struggle that Paul had within his own heart. So he was looking at the church, he was looking at those in the church, and he saw such a struggle in the church. And it was sad for him, and it, and it discouraged him in his heart. It, it caused a struggle or conflict to take place in him. I'm sure he cried out to the Lord many, many times that somehow the Lord would unify the body of Christ. Uh, he goes on to say here that this conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. His heart was that the church would be knitted together. It truly would be knitted together. I would say that that's simple, but yet it's difficult because we are individuals that have um, our own ideas and we are people that don't read the word of God, first of all, 
unfortunately. And, and I'm just saying that because it's the truth. I'm not accusing anyone here or anywhere else. But we don't read the Word of God. If, last week, did you read the Word of God every single day? Did you go through a chapter every day? Did you read three or four chapters so that you can go through the Bible in a whole year? Normally people don't do that. They expect to get the Word of God on Sunday morning, which they only get a few verses. Compared to if they read from Monday to Sunday, they would easily get 15 chapters. If you read three times five, 15 chapters a day, and you would go through the Bible in a year. And so because they don't read the Word, they don't have the instructions, they don't have the mind of God, and so their decision-making is all based upon what they think is right, what they've heard people say. And oftentimes, even in, in Christianity, people only share with others instruction and knowledge from what they heard from others and it's always second hand instead of hearing it straight from the word and, and if we really want to be in unity we need to be people of the word of God and we would be tightly knitted together I think that's really the key and the solution to it we wouldn't have differences of opinions and if we did have differences of opinions they would be very slight that we would just overlook them that's your opinion that's my opinion that's okay let's move on because it, it, it's not a lot of uh, there's not a lot of importance on that issue. So um comes back to that question again. Why are there churches that, you know, teach different things? It's because they're not reading their word. And that's what I love about Calvary Chapel, right? We just go through the Bible and we just expound on what's there. But that's his heart is that they be in unity. And verse 3 says, In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now this I say, least anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in the spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith. I love that little good order thing that he puts in there. To see your order really is in the Greek. There is no good in there. Uh, the, the printers put that word good in there because it, 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 it's the, the word order is talking about order and it's good to be in order so just help you to clarify what's being said there but the word good anytime you see that italics in the scriptures that's saying that the the printers put that in there to help you understand the text a little bit more but that word is in there so to see your order and i think that's important for us to see that church has to be a church that's in order things have to be orderly if it's not orderly it's chaos and if it's chaos and nothing's going to function or work correctly there will be just disorder all over the place so we have to be people of order. And people that are not of order need to learn to be people of order. It's a challenge for them because they're not used to it. Possibly their, their upbringing, their parents didn't care. They let them do whatever they want. They never gave them structure. They never gave them order. And so they grew up this way. And so they don't put a whole lot of value in order. Where other people uh, are very structured, very orderly, and they teach their children this, and they grow up to be very orderly. So uh, whether they're OCD or ADD or, you know, or they're uh, narcissistic, you know, all of those things are all parts of our upbringing. Um, I was that way when I was young, and I think it's because my mom was a, a very cleanly, orderly woman. She, she always had everything cleansed uh, in the home, in the yard, and so forth, and I just kind of grew up that way. I would literally tell her sometimes, let me stay home, I don't want to go with you guys, and I'd cut the grass, I'd, I'd weed all the weeds out of the planters, I'd turn the dirt over and make it look nice, I'd clean and vacuum the house, and she thought I was weird, you know, but I think it was something that I got from her. But an orderly church, I think, is, is very important. Our universe is in order. Can you imagine if it was in disorder? Those of you that went to create the Creation Museum, you probably saw maybe something about the universe and galaxies, how everything is just you know, in order, working perfectly. They say that, I was reading an article about the universe and the various planets and galaxies and how they're moving and so forth, and uh, they were saying that if this one uh, black hole just moved slightly a little bit more, it would cause such a ripple in, in space that it would affect us here on this earth. But that's how orderly God is, that mm. even the galaxies are ordered by him. Pretty amazing when you think yes. about order. And I know that people that are in disorder don't like to think about it because they think, oh, you're just, you're just too freaky for me. You're just too cleansly. You're too orderly. And that bothers me. But I think that they need to change and not the other way around. That's my opinion there, by the way. So he goes on. After talking about order and the steadfastness of your faith, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him. 
That is so important that we walk in the Lord, that we read his word and then we apply his word as we just uh, read earlier. Rooted and build it up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught abounding in it with thanksgiving. Have been taught what? The faith, what we believe, what Paul has written. Now, keep in mind, Paul is writing to the church. So they didn't have the Bible at that time, right? So they're getting these letters and Paul is correcting them on whatever issues that they're going through, whether it's the Colossians, Ephesians, or the Philippians, or, or, or so forth. He's, he's correcting them, and now they have letters. And they copied those letters, and they started passing them around to everyone else. And, and that's where we got our Bible. Back in um, the Counts of Nisan, uh, they got together, and they took all these letters, and they decided, let's, let's look at these letters, and let's see who they're written from, to who they're written from, and, and how they're written. And they all agree that these letters that have been written are all letters from the apostles, from Jesus Christ's uh, ministry and the gospels, and they put it together and say, this is the Bible. Now, they did, and, and this is hard to really understand, they did not choose which letters to put in the Bible. They agreed that the letter belonged in the Bible because of its context and because of what was said in it. I don't know if that makes sense. It's such a fine line, but it's a line that is there. And we have to try to understand that. Um, I, I don't have an example that comes to mind at this moment. But think about that for a little bit. They, they didn't choose which books. Because they had, I'm sure, a lot of letters and different books. But they read them all. And the ones that just seem to flow and work together and seem like it was one person writing it, those are all those, and they just agreed, these got to be from God. These are from the apostle. These are from Peter. These are from John. And, and they're all pertaining to Jesus Christ and his resurrection, his death, and the instruction for the church. So they all agree. And these are the things that we should be instructing one another on that Paul said is important, building each other up. Then he goes on, <clears throat> verse 8, <clears throat> Beware lest anyone <clears throat> cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. There's a lot there, and again, it's, it's pertaining to the Bible. There are men out there <clears throat> who want to deceive you, and they're going to give you their philosophy. They're going to give you uh, their empty wisdom, which is deceit. They're going to give you their traditions. They're going to give you uh, what... They want to give you the basic principles of this world instead of giving you the word of God. And there will be people that take the word of God and say, listen to me, this is what the Bible really teaches. Don't listen to those other teachers because they're not teaching the word of God. But yet they're pulling it all out of context just to meet their, their beliefs. And so it's important that we read the whole Bible and not just part of the Bible to get the whole counsel of God. Um, and this is so deceptive. That's why it's deceptive. <laughs> because it's so cunning the way the enemy uses uh, people in these uh, places and positions. You talk to someone today like the Jehovah Witnesses, which five, 10 years ago, uh, you could talk to one and you know exactly what they believe, but today it's so hard to, to really decipher. They're so deceptive now. Oh yeah, we believe in Jesus. You believe Jesus is your savior? Oh yeah, we believe Jesus is our savior. You believe you need to receive Jesus? Oh yeah, we need to receive Jesus in our heart. And they sound so Christian. But if you know their doctrine and you ask them point blank, well, you believe that he's Michael the archangel. And they'll go, yeah, we do. Well, that's not in the Bible. Well, it, it is in the Bible. And they'll try to go to Jude and talk about Michael and how he had authority and so forth. But it doesn't say that it was Jesus. It says he's Michael. Why didn't they call him Jesus, who is Michael? They don't. So you have to pin them down. You have to know what they believe. And you have to know what you believe. So... Um, Again, you got to be in the Word of God. And I feel sorry for those that aren't reading the Word because they're being tossed to and fro all over the place and they're confused and they get frustrated because churches do different things and what is the truth? And yet they have this right in front of them and they still won't read it. They're, still, they're like wanting God to just put it in their head, I guess, and it just doesn't work like that. There's work to it. For in Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, verse 9, and you are complete in Him who is the head of all principalities and power. So he's repeating what he said in chapter one. Christ is, is the head, he is the preeminence, he's the principalities, he's the power. In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands 
by putting off the body of the sin of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Now he's going to Old Testament, not that you were circumcised physically, but Christ has circumcised your heart by his indwelling Holy Spirit. Buried with him in the baptism, and these are all the things that, that Christ did for us, right? He circumcised us in our hearts that we're changed, we're different. The, the, the sin of flesh has been done away with. We're buried with him in baptism, uh, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your trespasses and uncircumcised of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having given you all, uh, tr all trespasses, forgiving you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirement that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. He's talking about the Ten Commandments. These, the Ten Commandments were actually accusations against us. You know, the first one is to lo love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. What he's saying is, you don't love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, because who has? The next one was, you know, do not take the Lord's name in vain, but it's, you have taken the Lord's name in vain. How many have used his name as a curse word? Keep holy the Sabbath day. You haven't kept holy the Sabbath day at all. You haven't not steal. You haven't not lied. You haven't not cheated. You know, uh, he just got, it, it's an accusation against us. It's a decree that says you're guilty because you haven't been able to keep it. But he's done away with that because of his death on the cross, which I say amen and thank you, Lord, yes. for all that you have done. And having disarmed principalities and powers, verse 15, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over it, over them in it. Therefore, let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbath. And I think we take this scripture wrong because some of us will look at this and say, see, don't judge me because I don't go to church. Because he's saying there, don't judge me because of the Sabbath. Um, I think we're taking this scripture wrong. I think what Paul is saying here, that a lot of you are going to church on different days. You're fellowshipping on different days. And don't let someone stop you from going to church. And we've twisted that around to say, oh, we don't have to go to church and you can't judge me on that. Yes, we do have to go to church. Um, it's important. Someone said, uh, when I asked a question about that, they said, I said, we are the church. Well, then get to church. Because you are the church, and the church should be in church, because that's where they gather together, in church. Uh, be careful how you use these scriptures, or festivals, or new moons, or Sabbath. Then he goes on in verse 18, Let no one defraud you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Um, worshiping angels. Do we do that today? Yeah. There are people that do worship angels. I remember um, a real good friend of mine that, that was here for a long time and, and, and instrumental in helping us with the church. And I remember one time he was reading a book and he came up to me, Pastor Ruben, did you realize there were a lot of angels? Go, yeah, the Bible talks about you know, uh, a third of the angels had fallen from heaven. He goes, well, do you know the names? I go, well, I see there's Gabriel, uh, there's Michael. Um, I don't know of any other names. There might be another name. No, there's, there's Raphael and there's this one. And like, where did you get that? Well, the Apocrypha. I go, well, that's not canonical. That's not from the Bible. He goes, yeah, but we, we have angels that have names and shouldn't we ta be talking about them? So there are those that actually worship angels. No, why don't we talk about Jesus? <laughs> Let's talk about him a little bit more and not necessarily angels. Angels were created by Jesus, Amen. so that makes them less than Jesus. One day we as believers will be judging angels, which makes them less than us. And so let's talk about Jesus. Angels are interesting. They're wonderful. But we have this fascination with them. Why is that? Because I think it pulls us away from Jesus. And I think there's an underlying satanic move to pull anything to pull us away from Jesus. You might like angels, so you have angels all over your house. I know people with statues of angels all over with the wings and all, and it's wonderful. Like we used to have a picture of an angel with two little kids walking on a bridge, yeah. you know, and how the angel protects them. It's biblical, but why not have Jesus? Well, we don't even know what Jesus looks like. 
let, let's make him uh, the preeminence. And this is the, the purpose of, of Paul writing to the Colossians. Look, Jesus is the preeminence, not angels, not anything else. Make him the preeminence. Even, even in your festivals, your new moons, your Sabbath, make him the preeminence. Uh, do those things as long as Christ gets the glory in all of those things. It says, not holding fast to the head of the body, nourished and knitted together by joints, ligaments, growth with the increase which is from God. Therefore, verse 20, if you died with Christ from the basic, basic principles of the world, why as though living in the world do you subject yourselves to regulations? So that was their problem. They put rules and regulations on themselves. Now these are not rules and regulations to keep order. These are rules and regulations that maintain their relationship with God. And if they broke them, then their relationship with God was severed. That's different than rules and regulations to keep order. I remember, um, what was it? We, we set a rule here that if you're serving here at the church, you need to be in service at least once a week. And I remember that caused a big old problem. People were like, that's a rule. That's a regulation. We shouldn't be setting those. We're to live by grace. No, no. Okay, so we changed it from a rule to, to a requirement, you know, that this is required of you for this church. It's not a rule. It's not a commandment. It's a requirement. But they, they couldn't get the, the grace that's behind that. We want you sitting in church. That's our heart. We want you hearing the word. We want you hearing from God. We want you to grow in, in the scriptures too. But we also want you to serve too at the same time. That's not what Paul's talking about here. Now, if I would have said, if you're not in church once a week, you're going to lose your salvation. That is a commandment and, and a tradition and not biblical. Because our salvation is not based upon us going to church once a week. Because if you miss one day... Oh, you're not going to heaven, you know. Or I could even say you need to be in church every, once a week and serve. Otherwise, God's not going to be pleased with you. Again, that's a rule and regulation that's not true. Because God is already pleased because of his son, Jesus Christ. So there's a difference there. Verse 21, do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines of men. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. So there is a appearance of wisdom. There is an appearance of wisdom. I was thinking about this uh, the other night how we can have an appearance of wisdom. You know, you can go to church regularly, uh, twice a week, whenever the doors are open. And that can appear to be wisdom. It can appear to be godly. But behind that heart that does that is a regulation that if I miss it, that somehow God isn't pleased with me. And that's a regulation. That's a religion. And so that has to change. We have to go to church because we want to, because God has asked us to, to fellowship together, to serve together. Uh, that's a self-imposed religion. And it can be very, very um, deceiving in appearance, even in humility and so forth. Um, I guess if you look at the life of Judas Iscariot, I mean, it's just plain and simple right there. He walked with the disciples he must be a disciple. He talked with Jesus. He must be a disciple. He uh, talked about the same subjects, the uh, kingdom of God and so forth. Uh, he saw the miracles. He was actually doing miracles because he came back along with the rest. Boy, Lord, serpents were, were subjected to us. People were healed. And wow, he must be a disciple of Christ. But it turned out he wasn't because his heart was totally different than the other disciples. And that was a, a, a false sense of, of wisdom and self-imposed religion. I think that the key here that, that Paul says it, uh, is, is very clear in the last statement, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. And I think that when, when you realize that what we're doing is really to allow us to indulge the flesh, then that's when we should kind of have a red flag up. Something's not right here. Something's not right because I'm trying to justify something in my own life instead of just glorifying God and doing things because we love him. So Paul is talking to the 
Colossians about putting Christ first, about understanding who he is. And that happens when you read his word and understand it. And as we do those things, we come to a unity. We're knitted together because we're submitting ourselves to the truth of the word of God. And that's our challenge today. God bless you guys. Thank you for joining us. And again, if you have any prayer requests, please post them and we'll pray for you. Let's go ahead and pray right now. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. And it's so exhaustive, Father. There's so much in there. We just, we just can't exhaust all of it, Lord God. And I just pray whatever was said today, Lord, your Holy Spirit would take and just minister to us, Father. And just those basic things, Lord, about spending time with you in prayer, about reading your word, taking time and just reading a chapter or two in the morning, maybe even in the evening, taking a few minutes, 10 minutes. That's all it takes to read a couple of chapters. 10 minutes is not a whole lot of time out of our day, Lord. And it would really strengthen us, Lord, in our walk with Jesus. And also help us, Lord, in the things that we're struggling with and just putting them all in order, Lord. Seeking first the kingdom of God and all its righteousness and everything else will be added unto you. Jesus promised that to us. It's written in his word. And we need to believe that, Lord. Would you bless your people? Encourage them today and meet their needs as they walk with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. And we'll see you on Wednesday.